Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline Melanick. Welcome to Chicken Reaction, a show that unpacks and dives deep into the latest trends and news, breaking things down block by block for the crypto curious. This year we're doing monthly series, diving into different topics and themes in crypto. And to start things off, this month we're focusing on NFTs. I'm interviewing some of the biggest NFT players and founders about how they've weathered the booms and busts in this sector, what they're focused on, and what could be next for the industry. Hope you enjoy. Today's guest is Devin Finzer, the CEO of NFT marketplace OpenSea. Devin co-founded OpenSea in 2017, and it quickly climbed to be one of the most well-known and well-funded NFT marketplaces. Two years ago, it raised $300 million in a Series C round at a $13.3 billion post-money valuation, bringing its total total capital raise to over $400 million. Some of its investors include firms like Andreessen Horowitz and Paradigm, as well as celebrities like Kevin Durant and Ashton Kutcher. Despite the NFT market's trading volume falling from all-time highs in late 2021, early 2022, OpenSea is still pushing forward, even though other marketplaces like Magic Eden has popped up and challenged their dominance. But as the tides change, pun intended, we're interested in hearing what the company has been up to and how it's mapping out its road ahead. With that said, Devin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And before we get to everything NFT related, we like to start by asking our guests, can you tell me about one of the most interesting people you've met in the past 12 months in crypto and what did you learn from them? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, Let's see. Most interesting people that I've met in crypto in the last 12 months. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I won't give a specific name, but I think one one sort of category of person and, and individual is just the um, the luxury brand, uh, the head of luxury brand sort of dipping their toe in the NFT space. I've been having um, some meeting with with various brands. This is this is kind of um, top of mind uh, recently, and it's just mm-hmm. interesting, kind of the whole spectrum of things that you can do in the luxury space. We tend to sort of think of um, the physical world of luxury, um, but there's this whole kind of digital universe that is really just starting to be explored. But it's impressive um, what some of these brands like um, LVMH, for example, have started doing with NFTs. And, um, you know, the, the I think the general theme that uh, I, I, I think just sort of um, dominates the NFT space is that, well, you know, certainly the market has changed a lot, the innovation and the amount of activity just on the ground floor of um, people building stuff, you know, everyone from smaller Web3 creators to mid-sized gaming projects to bigger brands, the innovation just continues to be really strong. So, um, yeah, I always I always feel like every time I meet a partner who's coming in from um, outside of crypto and into the NFT space, I'm just kind of blown away by, you know, just the level of awareness and education and um, sort of thoughtfulness that these bigger partners are, are bringing to the space, especially as it compares to a, a year or two ago when people were just first kind of wrapping their head around it. So mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because I actually have a question on that later. But before we get sure. into that, I want to dial back to like day one of OpenSea. Yeah. As I mentioned, you launched it years ago, back when NFTs weren't really a big deal. Like, at all. Uh, I don't know if you felt mm-hmm. differently. Sure, there were crypto kitties and no, crypto true. punks and things like that in the air, but yeah. it was really tiny. So I guess the question I have for you is like, what did you see then that made you want to start OpenSea? Yeah. And I think it's a great point because, um, you know, well, NFT, it's, it's certainly true that NFTs were really tiny back when we started in late 2017 and really just the first use cases were uh, coming about. Um, I would actually say that the market is still really early, right? In terms of what we saw back back then, um, we were really excited about NFTs as this highly generic technology that could be used to represent any digital item, right? Um, mm-hmm. That could be an item inside of a game. It could be a piece of digital art. Um, it could be a, an event ticket. It could be a domain name. It could even be a digital representation of a physical item. And so we really, you know, from the beginning, we saw this as more than just um, collectibles and profile pictures. Actually, in the beginning, we didn't even really think that profile pictures would be a thing. It was sort of a a brand new market that kind of emerged organically. Um, But we always had this really big vision of like, NFTs can represent 
all sorts of different things. Um, and it's funny that, you know, as you fast forward to 2023 and 2024, um, well, we've seen this explosion in the NFT market, particularly in 2021 um, with profile pictures and art and all of these exciting, you know, sort of early use cases, we still have so much further to go in terms of representing um, all of the kind of wide array of things that NFTs can represent. And, you know, gaming is an example of a category that's still really early. Um, uh, so so anyway, I, you know, to, to answer your question more directly, what we saw was this really powerful, basic primitive and all of these different use cases that could be represented. And that just got us really excited. And, you know, we always kind of technologists um, and startup founders are always a little more willing to kind of play around with the early toys, even if they haven't gotten mass adoption yet. I think that's kind of what makes founders unique is that they tend to be really early into markets. And certainly we were really early into OpenSea, but we were just so inspired by the opportunity and kind of the um, innovation that was happening in the space that we ended up, you know, continuing to build from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and then finally into mm -hmm. 2021 when we really saw the uh, rocket ship growth of the space. Yeah. Do you think OpenSea followed the initial vision that you guys had for all the opportunities here or has it kind of shifted into more focus on those like PFP aspects like you mentioned? I would say we've, we've actually really stuck to the original vision. And I think that's a, a unique thing among startups. It's not always the best approach but it has been uh for us and um you know we haven't built a lot of features that uh that only apply to the sort of collectible pfp art market we have built built some um but a lot of the features that we build we view as these more generic building blocks that work across all sorts of different use cases and even though some of those use cases are still more in their infancy we think that eventually they'll, you know, it, it's really the approach of kind of letting a thousand flowers bloom um, and mm -hmm. letting some of these earlier use cases experiment with the platform um, and see how they can take off. So we've really, yeah, we, I'd say that we we sort of started with this belief that NFTs would be super general and super generic and every single feature we build is either, you know, a generic horizontal building block or it's something that can at least be used across you know, a couple of different verticals. Um, and so, you know, particularly over the next um, year, we'll be building more and more of these, um, you know, vertical specific use cases, but we tend to build them in a pretty generic way. You talked about event tickets before and some of these things that you just mentioned. I'm curious, what are the expansion efforts going forward? Uh, like where, where does OpenSea see the future for its core product categories? Yeah, so um, a couple different areas. Um, the first is gaming is an area we've always been really excited about, really from day one. Um, if you remember back to 2017, the first use case, as you mentioned, was CryptoKitties, and it was a game. Um, and from there, you know, the gaming community, it was the, the Web3 gaming community was really small, but it was sort of the most passionate group of folks who are interested in kind of pushing the space forward. Now gaming has grown to be huge. There's been um, billions of dollars invested in Web3 gaming. Um, and a lot of the sort of investments that were made in 2020, 2021 are just starting to come to market and just starting to kind of actually find product market fit with real users. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's an area where we're really excited. Um, you know, we we've been involved everywhere from just you know supporting new primary launches for games with our primary drops product to building out some of these sort of utility um, oriented features like the ability to redeem an NFT on OpenSea, and then just all the kind of generic building blocks like um, onboarding and um, user experience that benefit the gaming industry. So I'd highlight that as, as one of our bigger bets. Um, and then, you know, things like physical items represented as NFTs, I could go on and on about as well, but um, there's a whole sort of host of other things that we're excited about, but I'd, I'd highlight gaming as a, as a really big one. So do you think gaming will be the big NFT driver for 2024? I think that is a really good shot. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about gaming is that, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily always show up in 
the volume numbers because sort of inherently a game economy does thrive on having, you know, gamers being able to come in and buy something for $1 or $2. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily going to have sort of the um, flashy effect that maybe a profile picture project mm -hmm. selling for thousands of dollars uh, each might have. And, um, and so sometimes it actually flies a little under the radar and it takes, a, it also takes a while for games to develop and find, you know, find really good fit with their audience. So I see it as more of this kind of, um, you know, it's, it's less of that, um, uh, you know, hype cycle based trend and more just the, the gradual development of the space and the maturation of the types of games. And if you look at like, you know, a snapshot of the type of, the types of gameplay experiences that you can have in web three today versus just last year, it's like, it's night and day. So I'd, in some ways I'd argue it's already kind of, um, you know, driving web three adoption. It's just maybe not mm -hmm. as sort of, um, uh, you know, visible as uh, other, other use cases for NFTs. Yeah, I agree with that. I, we've had guests on in the past who have talked about web three gaming and how it's kind of like, either baked in and like you don't even realize it's a blockchain based game or a web three game whatever you want to call it or it's like very prominent in your face you know you're using like a web three game and i i think yep. uh, to your point that these things will take time because it's not easy to make a game unless it's like something like angry not angry birds the one with the you know what i'm talking about flappy a little bird. pigeon flappy birds yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah, great but, game yeah, I, I think I definitely agree with you on that point. Um, you've been in this space for longer than I have, longer than a lot of people. I'm curious, what do you think has been the biggest surprise for you being in the NFT ecosystem after the boom, maybe? Hmm. After the boom, um, I think one you know pleasant surprise was post-NFT boom, you did see some larger companies sort of... Um, you know, move on from the space for sure. But generally, I would say that um, even the bigger brands uh, who you might expect to be sort of um, fair weather friends of, of NFTs continue to, you know, and, and I think the ones that are most dedicated and most interested in the space just continue to build things. So, you know, I think whenever there's a hype cycle in crypto, you have a rush of people who get really excited about it because maybe the price is moving up or like, you know, they hear about it from their friends or whatever. And then as the market kind of cools down, you have a lot of those people leave. Um, but mm -hmm. I was surprised at just, I think what's what's really captivating about NFTs is in contrast to some of the other areas of crypto where it really is purely about um, financial, you know, uh, services and speculation and prices and all those sorts of things. With NFTs, the technology itself is just so invigorating and so exciting that when you sort of join the space and get interested in it for the first time, you tend to stick around for the the sort of long term opportunity and the technology. And that was actually, you know, that's kind of what um, my story as well. And in, in sort of a uh, maybe at a smaller scale, I. I got interested in crypto because, um, you know, a lot of a lot of my friends were talking about it. And, you know, it was true that the price of Ethereum and the price of Bitcoin was going up. So it's like, OK, mm -hmm. what you know, what's going on here? Um, but then as I read the Ethereum white paper and particularly as I learned about use cases like NFTs, I was like, OK, this is interesting purely from a societal technological like trend. And um, I think I've been pleasantly surprised at the degree to which that has resonated with companies building in the space from the really small, you know, startup to the larger like brands that, you know, are maybe a little more traditional and way more conservative. Mm -hmm. I, I could partially agree with you on that. I think, you know, NFTs have that speculative nature. Some people really buy mm -hmm. into them because they want to like, you know, make the next board ape yacht club buy. And then there's also the people who end up becoming the quote unquote community members, which is kind of like a joke that you bought something you thought it was going to do well. And then you just become a community member. Um, and mm -hmm. as you mentioned with the brand aspect, we've seen social media platforms like Instagram commit to NFTs, then decommit. Uh, we've seen other web two firms launch NFT collections and then do nothing after. But then we've also seen ones that are like extremely committed, like you said. So I guess on yeah. that front, what needs to happen to keep these brands and industries and also just like retail investors engaged in the long term and not just seeing this as a fad? Yeah, I think one thing um, where it's been a mixed bag, we've both made a lot of progress, but we still have a lot of room to grow 
is making Web3 as accessible to regular users um, as the rest of the web and the rest of e-commerce. And what I like to kind of call the the holy grail of uh, of Web3 or, or NFTs or crypto, which is like getting the same, you know, onboarding experience, the same smoothness of user experience that, you know, you certainly can get if you go full on Web2 and you just have like credit cards and like, you know, you sort of fake the NFT experience, mm -hmm. all custody, you know, those sorts of things. But that real amazing user onboarding experience combined with the benefits and, and core native value propositions of Web3, which is like interoperability across different platforms, the ability to own an item and you know resell it on a, a you know a third party marketplace, all of those really amazing ownership of your own data, like all of those sorts of things. Um, so I think the opportunity for the space from our lens is um, building a, a feature set that allows people to get into Web3 both really easily, but also in a way that they can experience the benefits. Um, and that was not true in 2021. It really was the case that in order to participate, you had to be, you had to sort of level up your expertise and you know download mm -hmm. MetaMask or download your own wallet, figure out how to get crypto into it, figure out how transactions work, all of those things. Um, mm -hmm. And as we build during the sort of NFT bear market, now the infrastructure is at a place, uh, and actually one thing I didn't mention was just transaction costs, right? Like to, to buy an NFT on Ethereum. It's, <laughs> yeah, it, it is still expensive on Ethereum, but we have layer two solutions mm -hmm. now, which reduce that cost significantly. So, um, so point being what I think, I think one of the building blocks that needs to really mature and it's sort of our core, core focus that, uh, of the company is, um, again, getting that holy grail where we have really amazing user onboarding experience and user experience generally combined with the sort of power of um, Web3 and the interoperability and you know marketplace activity associated with it. There was actually something that uh, someone said to me recently where developers are building now for users and use cases opposed to like blockchains. And I feel like it mm -hmm. kind of applies to that for sure. Um, I'm curious yeah. on that front, we kind of talked a little bit about like speculation and everything. How much does NFT sales volume have an impact on your business? And like, how do you navigate that if it is substantial? Yeah, I mean, it certainly has uh, an impact on sort of the revenue of the business and the and the business model. Um, but it isn't something that we are laser focused on. I would say what we're laser focused on is really improving you know core product improvements we really really do view this space as early and um as such like so many of the things that we get to build are you know if you work at a traditional tech company you're like you know you're tweaking the text on a landing page or you're like mm -hmm. optima a b testing a, you know different sign up flow or something like that for us we're literally like going from like you got to download metamask and and have a seed phrase to okay, you can actually just sign up with an email and actually make a purchase, mm -hmm. right? So we're we're making those like really big step function product improvements. And um, and so we're less like, okay, we need to, you know, do this because it's going to like change our volume numbers or something like that. If, you know, if there were kind of things that we, you know, could do that, that were kind of like that, it would be, a, I'd say it'd be a different, a different type of business. Um, and uh, And then the other thing that we really focus on is just, you know, as opposed to just volumes, um, how are users engaging and are users going from signing up to transacting? Are users coming back and using the product? Are using, users buying interesting new NFTs? Um, are, and how much innovation is there at the product development phase for projects, right? Like, are the games getting better? Um, are, uh, are the art projects getting more interesting? Um, are new brands coming in? All of those signals, I think, are actually healthier things to look at than just, you know, did the price of board ape go up, you know, and then that sort of led to higher volumes for, for the company, for, for the company. Mm -hmm. I think accessibility is definitely something people look for, especially new entrants to the Web3 world. Um, I know yep. for people in my life that are not in crypto, if they had to download a MetaMask wallet and send crypto to it just to buy an NFT, I think I'd lose them at the first word MetaMask. Like, it, we wouldn't even yep. get to step two or three, you know, and now the fact that you could just go and buy it makes it extremely more accessible. And I think that's something that some platforms don't have. Um, so on that note, how does OpenSea 
compete with other NFT marketplaces to stand out, whether it's through accessibility, new offerings, features, products, like we talked about earlier, and kind of like remain competitive to have that market share and trading volume because you want people to use OpenSea. Totally. Um, so I think a couple things. One is um, we've built uh, enough um, services on OpenSea that, it, that our platform really can be a one-stop destination, one-stop shop for all of your sort of NFT use cases, right? You, you know, um, we've made significant improvements in accessibility around the wallet layer and just user onboarding. So you can, I think OpenSea is kind of the best place to start for new users, mm -hmm. also just on the user, user education front. Um, so articles about, um, you know, learning about what NFTs are and like, what are the use cases, all those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a great place to start. And then it's also a really great place to um, build out both your sort of portfolio of, of your inventory as a user. Um, and also if you're a project, um, you're, you're sort of one-stop shop for um, what we call OpenSea Studio, which is um, the ability to go, you know, launch uh, or create a contract, um, create NFTs, create a drop and do a primary launch on OpenSea um, as well as have the secondary marketplace on OpenSea. Um, the other thing that I would highlight here is we've made a lot of investments over the years in trust and safety. So uh, a big problem in the NFT space is, you know, people will have, and this is a problem that was was pretty part particularly difficult for us early on because we had so much of the sort of eyeball share of, um, of people coming to the space. You know, people would basically create an NFT that looks visually identical to, you know, board ape or whatever it is, um, and try to kind of pawn it off as, um, you know, as the real thing. We've invested a lot in um, ensuring that any sort of fraudulent or problematic collections get automatically removed from the website. Um, so I think the combination of all of those things um, really make OpenSea this kind of place where you can reliably you know, come, come to the platform and kind of get all of the, all you need from it, whether you're a user, you know, a first time user, or curious user, um, or even more of an advanced user, um, or you're a creator or project that wants to go and launch, um, you can, you can kind of, you can rely on us for, um, for sort of the full spectrum of capabilities and functionality. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of see OpenSea as, uh, NFT marketplace for earlier crypto users or like the seasoned like experts or it's for everyone then? I would say for everyone. Yeah. I mean, um, so we have both a, um, a platform, you know, the OpenSea proper, which is more um, sort of dedicated to someone who's newer or curious or more of the collector type. And then we also have OpenSea Pro, which is dedicated to the more um, advanced user. One thing that we'll be doing over um, the next couple of months is unifying these platforms so that it's easier to move between um, the sort of collector experience and the advanced experience. Right now, they're two separate platforms. You can obviously connect both your wallet to, to either one, um, mm -hmm. but there's a little more, uh, uh, you know, discontinuity between moving uh, from one to another. Um, so, yeah, I mean, our goal, I know that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of value in focus as a startup and really targeting um, a specific user base, but we really do think that NFTs are early enough that um, we can service you know the full spectrum of users, and obviously there are going to be people who want you know a a certain type of UI that maybe isn't quite what OpenSea is, um, and and those people. You know, there are other options, um, but we really do want to provide a platform that's generic enough that it'll appeal to um, the full mm -hmm. spectrum of users. Yeah, that's all right. You don't have to make everyone happy, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. On that note, we're going to take a quick break before we get into the rapid fire segment. And we are back. Now it's time for our rapid fire segment where we ask Devin some quick questions and hopefully get some quick responses. To start, Devin, what was the NFT or NFT project that you remember first getting you really excited about getting into this space? Definitely CryptoKitties. Um, yeah, I just thought it was really fun. It was uh, like the the CryptoKitties were really cute and uh, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> Do you own one? Uh, yeah, a bunch. All right. What are the three most surprising use cases you've seen for NFTs? If you had to list them. 
software licenses was a really interesting one. Um, so basically the ability to you know own a piece of software and use that software as long as you own the NFT, um, super cool. Um, I think just seeing like crypto conference tickets uh, catch on. Um, I think it's I think it's a really cool one because you already have people who are in crypto and um, you know being able to it's it's a little easier than needing to kind of go directly to mainstream with um, with like mainstream concert tickets or concert uh, music festival tickets. So so targeting crypto conferences I think is a is a really use, cool use case. Um, and then the third one. Uh, generative art i think is just really cool i mean we obviously have profile pictures and collectibles and all that stuff but there's just been so much interesting work being done on like using the attributes of the blockchain itself um to generate unique art um and it's something that has gotten um you know sort of the the people who are deepest in the space really excited because it's kind of nerdy and fun and, and interesting mm-hmm Yes or no? Do you think NFTs need to be renamed to something else? Not at this point, no. <laughs> How many NFTs do you own? Oh man, um, probably like a, a couple hundred or so, but a bunch of them are just you know me like fiddling around and testing mm-hmm. stuff. Which one's your favorite? Um, oof. I, I do really I like my cool cat, which is my uh, which is my Twitter profile picture. All right, given that this is a TechCrunch podcast, I've got to ask you, Devin: Is OpenSea looking to raise additional capital? Um, not at the moment. Okay, but when you guys do, you'll you'll come to us, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> there we go. All right, kind of stepping out of rapid fire. I would love to know to wrap things up. What other core use cases for NFTs do you think will be the most prominent in 2024 out of all the ones that we've discussed? Yeah, I mean, I think gaming is the one that I'm most excited about. The The other one that I don't think we talked as much about, um, which I would definitely highlight, is um, the idea of physical items represented as NFTs. So, you know, the the sort of way that this can work is you have a, I mean, if you look at existing marketplaces for rare physical sneakers they're actually quite mm-hmm. vibrant right there's a whole community of people to, that um like to sort of buy and sell um those sorts of uh, physical things and you know, obviously we, we talked a little bit about the, the luxury market as well um and so one of the really cool use cases for nfts is you know you take a physical pair of sneakers you create an nft you can buy and sell that nft um as many times as and it can move around from person to person before it's actually redeemed for the physical item. Um, and so we've been recently working with, uh, you know, some platforms on partnering and doing more launches in the sort of physical digital collectible space. And I think, um, you know, I, I just think there's a lot more opportunity to explore and a lot more opportunity for growth there as well. And then looking specifically at OpenSea, I asked about the future of the company's core product earlier on in the show, but what would you say is your core mission that you want to have in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think um, long term, our mission is really to foster open digital economies. Um, and so it's a, it's a very broad um, vision, um, but it does encapsulate the fact that we're really building NFTs as and we're building infrastructure around NFTs as a very generic building block for all sorts of different economies. It's not just about art and profile pictures. It's really about sort of representing all sorts of different things on chain, you know, all of the kind of use cases we mentioned today. And then, you know, some things that we haven't even imagined yet. Um, And in that world, you know, of sort of free market open digital economies, um, you know, it looks very different than the, the traditional web two economy where, users come on to centralized platforms, they sort of post data onto those platforms for free, but then Mm -hmm. the platforms monetize them through advertising or uh, other other means. But the data is always owned by the platform, right? In this new um, economy, users have a lot more control over their data. Users have control over their NFTs and their digital items, and they can move between different marketplaces and platforms. Um, And ultimately, we think that that's really good for users and it, it, it enables 
brand new use cases that people haven't imagined. It enables all sorts of innovation and enables new jobs in the future. Um, so, you know, NFTs are, we really think of them as this kind of generic building block for whole brand new digital economies. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, I think we're, we're still kind of at the beginning of that trend. Yeah, I love that. I'm excited to see what comes of that. On that note, Devin, can you leave us with a piece of advice, maybe something you've carried with you throughout your time in crypto? I mean, maybe advice for people who are uh, exploring Web3 and and crypto um, would be A, to really go deep in the space, make sure that you like, you're not just sort of um, uh, reading about NFTs at a high level, but you know, you're actually going and like, reading the code if you're technical or like obviously using the products and, you know, buying things and like trying them out and, um, and going into sort of the more maybe esoteric use cases. Um, but yeah, just, just the sort of depth of, um, you know, I, I think if you, if you just sort of read about it and you just like scratch the surface, you don't necessarily get the kind of nuggets of wisdom that you would get if you really go deep in the space. Um, and then the second piece of advice maybe for people who are either curious about crypto web three um, or who are already in the space is just, yeah, I think like thinking on long um, time horizons. So that's something that I am very proud of us doing at OpenSea. We started building really early on, um, but we knew that, you know, people tend to overestimate how fast technology, you know, gets adopted. And, um, but then they, you know, on the flip side, they kind of underestimate how big, those trends can be right that's the that's the sort of the age old um uh quote so um you know my advice would just be make sure that you're kind of operating and building on a long enough time horizon that you can really be part of the you know the broader trend mm -hmm. i love that all right thanks devin so much for coming on the show sure. this has been fun awesome thanks so much We'll be back every week with the top news on the crypto ecosystem. Catch us on Tuesdays for interviews with experts in the Web3 space. You can keep up with us on Spotify, Apple Music, or your favorite pod platform, and subscribe to our companion newsletter, also called Chain Reaction. Links to the newsletter and the stories we talked about can be found in our show notes, and be sure to follow us at Chain underscore Reaction on Twitter.